Good morning, everyone. Good, I got one good morning, thank you, from the front row. <laughs> We're gonna keep things moving right away, I suppose. Um, that was a, a great talk and a good session with, um, with Barbara and General Milley. Um, I, was, I was hoping to ask him about what, what, he, what he thinks of, of Donald Trump saying the military is decimated all the time, but <laughs> I can't tell you what he said backstage. <laughs> So we're on to our next panel. This is a, called, What Will Define Future Conflicts? A View from the Flag Officers. Only one of which you can tell is or was a flag officer. Well, the others are. He still is. Are, that's, that's right. Uh, <laughs> the others assure me that they were as well. And uh, what we're going to hear, I think, is a, an, interesting, an interesting concept. So this group is partnering with Arizona State University to try to bridge that civilian military divide in an interesting way. Um, and I'm going to let some of the panelists explain it themselves, and then we'll get into talking about how this applies to what's going on in the world today and uh, get some questions from you all. But I'll do some brief introductions of, the, of who, who's up here right now for us. Um, I have Lieutenant General Rusty Finley, retired, who was Vice Commander of Air Mobility Command, among other things. Um, we're going to do the quick versions of these. Next yeah. to him, the, the man in uniform, Lieutenant General Robert Schmidl, um, who is Principal Deputy Director at CAPE, the Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation, which was mentioned in the earlier session. Um, previously Deputy Commandant for Aviation. Um, going down the row, we have uh, retired Major General Maggie Woodward, who uh, was former Director of the Air Force Sexual Assault Prevention and Response Office. Um, and Prior to that was Commander 17th Air Force, uh, more importantly had a pretty uh, substantial role in the Libyan Air War, as we'll hear about um, on this panel as well. And then um, at the end, Lieutenant General Ben Freakley retired, who is professor at Arizona State University, professor of the practice of leadership, and a special advisor to the, the president of the university. Uh, let's see, well, Army previously, what's, what's, the, what's the best way to define your Army? Is Commanding General, U.S. Army of Sessions Command, you ran Fort Benning, is that right? Uh, before that. Yeah, at one point. Uh, the 10th Mountain Division. Also commanded 10th Mountain Division. So you, you can go on forever with the bios of, of these folks. But um, so <laughs> let me turn it over to you and, and tell us uh, about this program, this partnership with flag officers, what you're trying to achieve and kick us yeah, off. Yeah, I'm excited. I just want to spend a few minutes just to kind of give you some background on what the Flag Officer Advisory Council is at Arizona State University. And uh, it's, I think, goes along with, uh, you know, the innovative nature of uh, where Arizona State University's gone with uh, Dr. Crow's guidance and leadership. Uh, but it's, uh, we've been in existence for about two years now. Kind of Dr. Crow and Ben Frankly were the guys who kind of put it together. But we're about uh, 12, a dozen so, uh, mostly retired uh, general <laughs> officers uh, that come together three to four, five times a year, or as required, uh, to actually advise Dr. Crow personally on some pretty complex problems and how uh, higher education can play a part in solving uh, what Kevin talked about here, the growing divide in our country between the military and the civilian sectors. And I don't have to tell this audience, I don't think, uh, where that's gone, but uh, the fact that uh, less than one half of one percent of the nation has served since 9/11, uh, that that by by its nature that that makes that divide grow. Um, to that end, what we're doing, uh, I think, is some fairly uh, interesting stuff, and I think some important stuff. Uh, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, Arizona State University has established a public service academy. Uh, what this does uh, is, I hope and uh, we're going to help them reach this end, is interest and, uh, and gain some traction to get the college era of, of this time uh, wanting to devote their talents to public service. Uh, and it's just getting off the ground. Uh, actually, Lieutenant General John Goodman is chairing our working group on that. I'm on that working group, and uh, next Friday, uh, we'll be meeting again with uh, Brett Hunt, who's uh, been chartered to stand this up. Uh, but this is a pretty exciting thing, I think, to uh, bring these young folks, give them a little bit of exposure to what public service is all about, and hopefully get them motivated uh, toward that end. Uh, ASU also has a global security initiative that the Flag Officer Advisory Council is helping uh, with. 
And this is uh, an initiative that basically is designed to tackle uh, what some people call the wicked problems of the world these days, uh, things like cybersecurity, things like climate change, and et cetera. Um, we've got uh, a group of flag officers that are certainly going to help them try and move that agenda forward. And the final thing I'll mention is uh, our part with New America and ASU in the Center for the Future of War. And uh, that's the reason we're here today. Uh, certainly, um, near and dear to our heart to talk about complex problems that uh, as we look forward to make sure that the security challenges that we're going to face uh, have an aspect of, uh, of influence and trying to influence those and, and make a difference. Um, we've written a paper. Uh, the name of the paper is A Call to Action, Driving Change to Maximize the Strength of Our National Power. Uh, it's out there. Uh, Rooster Schmidl, uh, Lieutenant General Schmidl is going to talk a little bit about that here at the outset and then all of us are going to give you some experiences we've had uh, that drove parts and pieces of uh, what this paper, uh, what generated the paper. So Rooster, over to you. Okay, well thank you very much. So as we think about the, we came together to think about the future of war and to think about what we could do as a panel of flag officers with our experience. What you're going to see and read in the paper is discussions about the need for strategic vision, about the need for intergovernmental approaches and interagency kinds of things, sort of a holistic, a whole government look at the world. And what I would like to do over the next couple of minutes is just sort of set the stage for you about why we think this is so very different and why it needs a different approach. And then each of the panelists will give you some of their experiences and, uh, and, and some of the details of how we, we, uh, we applied this. So the first thing I would tell you is that, um, and this are, these are my beliefs, some of them have come from Michel Foucault and Giles Deleuze, but they're effectively, I think, a very accurate way of looking at the future. So war, I would suggest, it has become an internal institution in the state. War is no longer just raw battle, it's no longer just violence, it is actually institutionalized in, in the states. It, to the extent that I think we could more accurately talk about inverting Clausewitz's dictum that war is policy by another means, I would suggest that it is in fact just the opposite, that policy is war by another means, that we are in this constant state of conflict, of war, and it affects and permeates everything that we do in society. So if you think for a minute about the language that we use, right, and Wittgenstein was very good on this, and he said, the limits of my world are the limits of my language. So what do we talk about? We talk about the war on drugs. We talk about the war on cancer. We talk about trade wars. That, the use of those metaphors informs the way that we view warfare as something that I would suggest is not another. It's not something else that we do besides peace. It is the defining characteristic. And I think along those lines, it's important to understand that that the dichotomy between victor and vanquished is not clear, it's not stark. It certainly, if you look back in history, you would find great reason to be skeptical of that. At the very least, it's temporal, it's localized. What we ought to be talking about is not who won or lost, which is kind of the conversation that I think it, it doesn't really add value to this discussion about the societal changes that are occurring. But what we ought to think about is who became stronger or weaker because of this kind of interaction. And it's, it is in fact the, the nature, I would suggest, of the relations both w between states and within states. So for example, here, where does war, an example of how it permeates society, it leaves its mark on our society through the, the intermediate, intermediary of the military institutions. So we are the, the manifestation of how society views warfare in the extent that, that the taxes and recruitment and the things that society is required to do in order for us to be able to have, to, to be a military and to perform those missions. The, the, the downside I would suggest or the danger is that we tend sometimes to focus too much on tactics and platforms and we don't focus enough on the larger sort of holistic strategic issues and the critical thinking that goes behind answering the question, so in order to do what? Or so what comes next after I do X? How do I translate that particular tactical action into some kind of operational or strategic uh, end state? So along those lines, I think that as we look forward to how we would think about warfare 
between here and into the future, I think it's, it's important to understand that we have entered a society of control, right? That everything that we do is controlled, the 24-hour news cycle, the ubiquity of our staying connected on iPhones, et cetera, et cetera, that, that the important thing in the future is not going to be a barrier, the physical barrier that keeps you out of another enclosed space. It's going to be the code and the computer that runs that barrier. So we've gone from having bureaucracies that are entrenched, that, 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 that are where the power flows from, to the power flowing from bits and pieces and bits of RF energy and the, the quote, normalization of surveillance. And if you think about that as a means of control, and the last thing I would leave you with is that as we look forward, it seems to me that what this portends is that military action, warfare, societal organization writ large, we ought to be striving for things like higher transaction rates, for more rapid turnover, for continuous modulation, as opposed to discontinuous modulation. For instance, the way we plan wars in phases, phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, that going forward we ought to be thinking about this in terms of a continual, um, a continuum, if you will, of conflict, that there is no time of peace between this. We are in a state of war, and to quote uh, Gersimov, it is literally wars in the future will not be declared. They will simply be an increase in the level of violence so that there's this sort of low level, level, if you will, of violence that is going on all the time. So those are, that's kind of the sort of the mindset, the thing that, that framed the way we were thinking about this. So now um, I will uh, turn it over to the other panelists to give you some of their uh, experiences and insights that would relate to how we got to this notion about a holistic approach, about the need to break down the silos of agencies in government, wherever they happen to be, and this, this continuous approach and look at, uh, at the way we think about strategy going forward. Well, th thank you, General. Before we get the, the examples, though, I, let's clarify for the audience uh, a little bit about the paper you mentioned and your recommendations. So it, it's, there are three, rec three recommendations in them, and if I recall, one, it's you want more strategic thinking, you want a greater focus on the whole of government approach and breaking those silos, as you said, but also the whole of society. That's correct. Uh, so uh, let's, if you think with those three pieces in mind, give your examples, we'll come back to some okay. of those solutions, including you, you, you guys had said, putting a lot more uh, focus and, and power at the National Security Council to, to empower that group to become a, you know, that strategic thinking body that you're arguing is missing right now. Well, I think Libya is a, is a really good example um, in that, uh, you know, it's easy to see the political quandary that somebody would be in as, as we're looking at, you know, tens of thousands potentially being massacred in Benghazi and our, um, you know, uh, requirement to protect those individuals and balancing that against the fact that we're already engaged in Iraq and Afghanistan and we're stretched pretty thin and, and our country, our nation is war weary. How do we balance those two competing demands? and the pressure coming from uh, um, our European allies to, to help support their uh, commitment to Libya. And I can understand the compromises necessary uh, when, when those are thrown out, but the problem that we see is that when you compromise, you can't compromise on the strategy. And the strategy, uh, I believe, in, in the case of Libya at the time, was compromised. You know, when, when we're given lead from behind and, and be prepared to hand over to NATO as, as the strategy to plan to, that becomes, uh, you know, a, 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 that's not a strategic vision. And, and that is um, one of the um, big points that we think is absolutely uh, critical when we're going to engage military force. I think sometimes in Libya, uh, as, as we came out of that conflict and, and we met our, our tactical goals, uh, one of the things, concerns I had is that uh, our joint force airmen do such an incredible job, are so talented that they make the application of air power look low risk, easy, and relatively inexpensive. And in that case, it's a little bit too easy to apply. Uh, but I think we always need to keep in mind that when you're applying military force, you really need to realize that that is a, a significant catalyst for change. And you have to be plan, you have to plan and you have to have in mind what you're going to do with the chaos that follows that. And I think that's where we're left with in, uh, in Libya right now. We took the tactical 
um, tasks that we were given. Uh, we asked for more strategic guidance. That wasn't really forthcoming. So in the absence of, of that, you know, the military will always fill in the gaps. So we did what we needed to. We were told we're not seeking regime change. And in fact, we were given specific orders, you know, to, to not attack certain targets because that looked too much like it would be seeking regime change. But we always have to plan for a longer um, view. And when we ask the question, what then, we need an answer uh, when we're making um, our strategic decisions. And in this case, I think that wasn't really um, the case. We wouldn't get the answer to the, the question, what then. Um, and I think what we're seeing currently in Libya, unfortunately, is a, uh, the chaos there is a little bit of a uh, response to that. You can also roll in the other two uh, pieces of what we talked about, the whole of government, the whole of uh, uh, society solutions that would be necessary if you're going to commit to something where we're going to apply that military force. Both of those other two principles have to be applied. And in this case, I think because we were trying so hard to, uh, to do this uh, with minimal, as we said, minimal involvement, uh, lead from behind, those weren't applied and uh, we were left with the chaos that follows. Uh, really quick overview, I know, and I'll be happy to talk uh, to questions afterwards uh, for more detail, but I'll hand it off now to uh, General Freakley to talk about. I'll go next. Okay, and, Iraq. Uh, I, I was in Iraq uh, 2005, 2006, and then went on to CENTCOM uh, for two years after that. And uh, <clears throat> despite our better efforts, I think uh, what, and, and this is kind of the statement of the obvious, because most of, most of the folks in this room have studied it, so that it's not going to come as a surprise to you, but trying to get the whole of government approach uh, to solve the problems uh, of Iraq and move forward uh, was very, very difficult. And it was difficult from a resourcing standpoint. Uh, you know, we had the, the lines of operation. We had a governance line of operation, an economic line of operation, a security line of operation, a communications line of operation. Military took care of the security line of operation. That was uh, uh, not a problem, applying the resources to that. Uh, but it's like Maggie said and, and others have said, uh, you always need to ask the question, then what? Uh, so when we stabilized Iraq, then what? And uh, the country's not going to move forward uh, unless they've got a representative or a, or a functioning government. And uh, trying to bring American power and forces, i.e. Uh, other departments in to try and help. It wasn't that they weren't willing to do it, uh, although in some cases maybe that was the case. Uh, they just didn't have the, the wherewithal and we didn't have the wherewithal as a nation to make, uh, to make that happen. And uh, it's, uh, it's still lingering with us today, isn't it? Uh, so a whole government approach, some way to work on those mechanisms and processes to apply this uh, vast power we've got in this nation in all facets of our government uh, to the crisis of the day or the problems of the day or the war of the day is something that I think uh, uh, deserves, it's had thought before, it deserves more thought. Uh, it deserves more thought and uh, hopefully some action uh, that could drive us to do a better job of that. Uh, and we've got a lot of lessons learned uh, that we can apply. You just heard Libya, you can, you, we can talk about Iraq all day. Ben's got a few that uh, he wants to relay now as well. Well, I had the opportunity and the honor to serve as a combined joint task force commander in Afghanistan from 2006, 2007, my wingman, Chris Miller, sitting right there, the command of the air component element of that. And our challenge was, we, in our paper, we're calling for a return to strategic vision and getting back to articulating strategic in-states by the National Command Authority. And we were operating along, like Iraq, with some lines of operation, reconstruction, governance, and security, but to what end, what's next, if we achieve that, what would follow to General Smittle's point about what's the framework in thinking about what you're trying to achieve. And this body, New America, Arizona State University, the media members and the great thinkers that are in this room, we need to drive our country back into thinking about strategic vision and develop from our society strategic thinkers. Our point on whole of government is we have a great capability, diplomatic, politically, informational, economically, uh, to, and militarily to, to, to make change, to be the disruptor that General Woodward talked about. 
but we have, we have yet to, uh, since really you could argue Desert Shield, Desert Storm, we have not blended and used all elements of our power in a coherent fashion to achieve a strategy. We have not kept political pressure or economic pressure or even informational pressure on our adversaries. Uh, we created the social media uh, ideas, but they're being used by Vladimir Putin and, and Baghdadi uh, far better than we are. And part of it goes to if it takes nine years to get a, 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 a pistol approved, how long does it take a message to be able to be released by the United States government as a tweet? A lot. The National Security Council today is 400 people, 400. So um, our challenge in, in uh, Afghanistan was we did not apply whole of government. The 21 uh, USAID folks that were in our joint task force, 17 of them were contractors and didn't know how to apply aid power in concert with military and strategic objectives. Uh, our diplomacy, did, again, did not keep pressure on the region. So we're calling for a return to uh, whole of government solutions, a return to uh, reaching out to our societies, getting uh, like-minded universities like Arizona State University into the fight. Uh, Nangar province in Afghanistan has 342 growing days a year. Wouldn't it be useful if a land-grant university provided agriculture advice to Nangar that grew longer and employed more men and women and kept them out of joining the Taliban? What a good idea but we couldn't get that done, although we tried. And so uh, what we're driving towards, revision of the National Security Act and revision of the National Security Council, if Nichols Goldwater could compel, compel the joint forces to work together, how can we have legislation and an administration that rewrites the National Security Act, reworks the National Security Council to a light, fast-moving strategic organization that provides strategic policy options to the president, which then coordinates those uh, options uh, to fruition. There have been calls for this, but we're, 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 we're calling for a driving change and pressure on the government to reform the National Security Council and bring whole of government and whole society together to reach our strategic end states that we have to get back to. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. Um, and I'm... So, I, I, think I, I wanted to talk more about pistols, but Mark, yeah. Mark, Mark told me he covered <laughs> that, so I, I wasn't allowed to. <laughs> I think you'd like to have the money and time that they've been afforded to pistols uh, to do some of these programs. So, it, so let me, let's re recap. We're, we're, this is an era of constant conflict now. There is no more peacetime, no more phase zero. Uh, it'd be great to have a whole lot of non-military help to achieve uh, the objective of basically putting down conflicts, ending well, them, I, creating I peace. That, I, it's not only great. If, right. if we're going to bring our military size down, yes. which we're doing, the other parts of the government cannot uh, be downsized. They've got to be enlarged. The, the military has to be applied to be the disruptor that Maggie talked about, right. and then state and others are going to have to come in with USAID and be the what's next phase because the military is not going to be able to do it anymore. So uh, let, let me tell you what I heard, and then we'll, I want to we'll start spreading out to questions. Um, you know, the, start with Libya and Iraq, the idea that it would be nice if there was an end state beyond that. I've heard in the last few weeks, several, or the last few months, several of the, either the chiefs or the chairman himself saying, we could go into Raqqa today. We could, we could go into Libya and hit the camps today. It'd be great though, if we had a government ready for us at the backside and we were doing it at their invitation. Where, and we want, the, we want the diplomatic side to get Libya in order first. And when they're ready, at their invitation, or at least with a nice blessing, then we'll go in and take care of business and come out because, because we'd want to be there. Ne General Neller himself said, I don't want to be in Raqqa one day more than I have to. We could do it, but I don't want to, I don't want to do that yeah, anymore. Yeah, I think one of the things when I was in Iraq, one of the things we always said was, uh, uh, you know, we want the Iraqis to want it as much as we want it for them. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I think that's probably some so, of what but, he was getting at. So here's the question. The problem is that, you know, I'd like my girlfriend to have the same attitude, but you can't force them to want you, <laughs> right? So Bingo. isn't this a very U.S.-centric way of solving the Middle East problems? I'll, just, I'll throw that out there for one se second. The, what I was going to get to was the idea that it, it that the U.S. needs much greater coordination and resources from the non-military side, from the diplomacy, from the defense. I came to Washington in 1998, and I've heard this every year since 1998. And I remember at a point there was a time where it was a Democratic Congress, it was Barack Obama in, in office, and Hillary Clinton at the State Department, and Bob Gates at the uh, Pentagon begging for this, and not much happened. 
And without, at that moment, if nothing could happen, why do you think you're going to get traction now? Where do you start? Do you start at the top? Does it have to be the new administration, the new president, someone in the White House makes it a priority? Or is it on the bottom, or some combination, I guess, this is what you're going to tell me, of, of getting the American public involved somehow? How do you do that in an all, with an all-volunteer force? Getting the whole of government better involved, changing political uh, ideas, you know, preparing for either President Clinton, President Trump, President, whatever the options are that are out there today. What's your plan of attack now? Where do you start? Well, the start is what, what we're doing today, I, I believe, is that we really want to raise the discourse. We want to raise the level of understanding about how important the strategic uh, vision and, and that whole government piece is, and that um, it, obviously it's not something we're going to achieve overnight just because we say it needs to be done, but, but we do think we need to talk at a higher level, and we really need to, to think in the long term rather than be reactive. We need to be proactive and, um, and go back to the old days of having a very uh, broad, uh, overarching strategy that carries across the globe. I, I, it's got to be in forums like this. It's got to come from America, but it also has to be pressure on our Congress to create a Nichols Goldwater-like act for a whole of government solution. We've got to go ask the uh, veteran members of the Congress, were they happy? With, uh, were they satisfied did it, as they served in the military? Uh, did they achieve the strategic goals that, uh, or did they see the strategic goals achieved that they were tactically uh, trying to influence, or would they like to see change? They can help drive the change. They, we've got to get the government, the nation, reinvolved. If we could be the nation that were the architects of the Second World War, if we could be the nation that that uh, used uh, a team to counter the Cold War, if we could be the nation that that uh, you know, if you told me as a major that on my left flank would be a French division, on my right flank would be an Egyptian division, and Desert Shield, I'd say hey, that's not going to happen. But it happened because we used the whole of government approach and bringing others into it. It's not a U.S. centric. It should be, but we have to be, have our whole house in order first. But it's got to be pressure from the top and the bottom to create change. And, and not just having a good idea, because people do write about it, and then that's the article for the day, and they walk away. There's got to be constant pressure to create the change. I guess what I'd say is uh, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Lucky you. Since, since 1998, most of the people in Phoenix, Arizona haven't been reading about this, haven't been hearing about this. Uh, certainly inside the Beltway here, uh, it, is a, it is a regular topic of conversation. Uh, I think what, and, and again, this, not to be too Pollyannish about it, but I think uh, starting at the grassroots level, something like the Public Service Academy that ASU has got uh, going, in trying to get some of these young men and women that uh, uh, aren't inclined to serve in uniform but uh, could be possibly interested in helping to solve these kind of problems. Is it a tomorrow kind of solution? Probably not. Uh, but if we don't start talking about it, if we don't start working at it uh, in forums like this and then take it outside the beltway to some of our public universities such that we get some of the young folks that are that are coming up and inclined to, uh, to tackle some of these kind of problems. We're going to be stuck in the mud we've been stuck in for from 1998, and we're going to go to another conflict, and we're going to have this vast array of resources and power across this government uh, that is going to be applied in a disjointed fashion. So I, I think m maybe if, if we understand that, uh, that there are some sort of seismic things that are happening in the way societies view governance and the way we view warfare, and perhaps the way that we're thinking about the military application of power is in need of revision, that we, the, the, the fact that we can apply force from one side to another in sort of a direct linear fashion, maybe we ought to think about that. Maybe we ought, to, we ought to understand that part of what we're talking about here with the disconnect of society is a result of the all-volunteer force. It's a result of some, of some decisions that we made about the way we're going to construct the military and what we expect the military to do for the country. And this, so we are seeing the results of some of that. I think, too, that, that understanding that there is, in fact, uh, there are some very big changes afoot in terms of the way that societies view their populations, the way that states interact, and 
and make no mistake about it, a state is a thing like ISIL. It has state-like behaviors. It has control-like behaviors. And, you know, maybe backing away from this thing and thinking less conventionally about how to apply the conventional things that we have, the platforms and the tactics that we have today, and to think about coming at this from a different stand standpoint, which is why I made the comments, it's not just computer stuff, although my time at Cyber Command has convinced me that there is some there there, but it's it's this whole notion of the way we think about planning, the transaction rates, the, the constant turnover, that kind of thing, um, is and, and just trying to get more people to understand that so that when we go into things like this, with our eyes open at least, um, you, you know, famously General Dempsey used to say that, he used to love quoting Einstein who said if we had a problem, that uh, how would you solve the problem if you knew the world was going to end in an hour? He said, well, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about it, and then the last five minutes I'd act. Well, I would suggest that we do just the opposite. We immediately start to act, and then 55 minutes later, we go, holy cow, the world's going to end in five minutes, and we're not there yet. So oh, then what? Yeah, then what? <laughs> so it, it just, it, it's, it's kind of those things, and, you know, and to Ben's point, it's talking about it in forums like this, but I think it's our willingness in uniform to be more open and more unconventional about the way we see all the pieces of the national, uh, of the society and of national power coming together. That's well, we're at under 10 minutes, so I see some hands and huh. we have a good amount of hands. Excellent. I saw this one in the front first. Get a, a microphone. We have microphones coming up the middle right here. On its way. Thank you very much. Gordon Bear, Army and State Department, retired. Uh, in my view, the State Department is not particularly capable and worse, not particularly willing to support America's wars. With reference to the National Security Council staff and policy formulation, the Deputies Committee meetings these days usually have more people from the National Security Policy staff at them than all other agencies combined. I would appreciate comments on my observations. Uh, here's what I'd say with respect to the State Department and my experience in Iraq. Um, some of what you said is, uh, is my experience was true. Uh, Secretary Rice at the time uh, said, hey, we're going to send our best and brightest uh, from the state over to help solve this governance problem and help the Iraqis move forward. Um, we got some really great folks. Most of them were 30 to 35 years old. Not very experienced, but really motivated. Um, would have been nice to have, I mean, we had seasoned Mideast diplomats there, but they needed help from other seasoned diplomats to solve the big problems we were trying to solve with the Iraqi government and help them work their way through it. Uh, most of those people, unlike the military, when they told me, you're going to Iraq and you need to be there in two weeks, those people got said, we'd like you to go to Iraq, and they said, ah, I don't think so. Uh, so there, there was some of that going on. Now, I, I, I say this right off the get-go. Uh, the people that we got over there were motivated and great individuals trying to help solve the, solve the problems the ones that came. We, we ought to distinguish between the functions that we want the State Department to perform mm -hmm. from the agency itself. I, I think that's probably a healthy thing for us to do to understand better what is it that we wanted and expected them to do in terms of the functions with regard to the larger um, uh, operation and then deal with the agency. Is just, I mean, I don't disagree with what you're saying, but it's just, it just may be a way for us to try to get our hands or our head around what it is that we want from them. We ought to be able to articulate that. Uh, well, it's in uniform, so. Part of the uh, National Security Council reform that we would uh, advocate for is a, a great reduced, uh, much smaller, faster, uh, more agile, more adaptive. This, uh, when uh, General Smittle talks about transaction rate, they ought to have a high tra transaction rate of getting things done. Uh, as I said in my remarks, having 400 at the NSC now is, is a little bit bureaucratic. 
There are a lot of hands, but uh, we have one hand that gets precedent here. Anne-Marie <laughs> has, is dying to uh, remark on, on what was asked. I, I can imagine what she's going to tell us. Yes, I am. Uh, <laughs> so I do feel a need to set the record straight uh, with respect to the state in Iraq. It is important to remember that Paul Bremer tore up the State Department's <coughs> plans for Iraq. Right? It's not that, the, and, and it doesn't mean that everything went perfectly, and it doesn't mean there aren't problems. There are. But that was as much a problem between a political appointee and the State Department as it was between the State Department and the military. I just want to make remind everyone of that. Agree. Okay. Uh, but also, I did want to just say one thing, because I wrote about this recently. I was asked, what is the single, if you had to make one change in national security, what would you make? And I totally agree with you about the size of the Security Council staff. But I also think, and I, I welcome comment, but... but the most important change I, I would have liked to have seen was the National Security Council designating a lead agency on every initiative. Because what happens mm -hmm. is they convene and you meet, but nobody's in the lead, and then they don't have bandwidth to convene again, and then we all collude on not doing anything until they finally get around to calling us back. And they don't want to designate a lead, but ultimately you got to say somebody's in charge. No, we think uh, just like Nichols Goldwater established combatant commands that didn't exist before and gave them authority, power, and responsibility, we would hold that the National Security Council needs power, authority, and responsibility, not only internationally, but domestically, uh, to bring in the Council of Economic Advisors, to bring in the Homeland Security Council. Uh, you know, we threw $80 million at Flint, Michigan. Is, is, is the solving the water there, which is tactical, hugely important because these people are suffering, our citizens, but... Is that the beginning of our infrastructure failure in, in potable water for our population, or is it just one and done? But where's the strategic view of our infrastructure and where we invest as a country, and how do we get our uh, academic institutions, think tanks, and others behind thinking about this so we mobilize whole of society and solve it and move forward? But the NSC should be the coordinating and, and uh, authoritative entity that provides the advice to the president, gets the policy approved, and then overwatches it getting enacted. Okay, this gentleman here, and I'll say we're within five minutes, so let's try to keep it brief and maybe can cycle through a few more questions. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlanta Council and Business Executives for National Security, and I commend your noble effort, but it's not going to work in my judgment for a very simple reason. The issue is not a continuous war, it's the change in politics. The diffusion of power has not only gotten rid of the Westphalian system, but it applies here in Washington. And the size of the National Security Council staff ain't 400, it's closer to 800, quite frankly. Unless you can deal with the change in politics in which White Houses have become successively more controlling because they're untrusting of the various bureaucracies and so forth, you have to understand the change in politics to be able to get your message through. And I would just ask the panel to consider, as you try to do this, virtually every other think tank in town is doing the same thing. Unless you understand how politics has really changed and has changed dramatically, unfortunately, these messages are not going to get through, and the nation will suffer, in my judgment. Thank you. So, Arlen, you're, you're absolutely right about the control issue. You know that uh, societies of control, which I would suggest we are evolving into, control by individuation as opposed to mass, right? So uh, you don't have a mass of people in a factory anymore. You have individuals that are on merit pay, that kind of thing. So that is a way of control. There's no question about it. You drive down and you do the kinds of things that we were just talking about. Why is there not a lead agency? Well, because there's a lot of individuals that you can control better in terms of trying to get that message out. And I think, uh, and I think too, that we are not, um, uh, naive enough to think this is going to change overnight. What we were trying to do is to pose some some issues that, that for people to think about. Ultimately, you're absolutely correct. It ultimately is a political. It's a it's an organization that supports the president. And uh, but you know we just thought there were ways we could do that more efficiently and effectively. So the question really may be how do you operate inside of a control society now that you've recognized that you're there. How does that deal with a bureaucracy when it runs into a bureaucracy from a, from a legacy society, if you will? So. Well, we're, we're at the end of our time to wrap, so I, I, I'll thank the panelists, but just recap you know, the idea that, uh, again, with constant conflict, reshaping the government, reshaping society, getting more folks involved, you know, not to mention it's 2016, uh, and trying to engage everyone in, in the political process as well. Um, 
it's, you know, I'm, I wasn't surprised to hear that this was the paper that this panel came up with. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm a reporter. I'm the executive editor of Defense One, by the way, and thanks to the New America Foundation, we're one of the media sponsors. And you can read all the Future of War columns on defenseone.com. That's my plug. Um, yeah. But I'll say, you know, I, I'll go back to what I said in the beginning. This is, this is, this is bubbling up uh, from the services, from the four stars. I've heard the, the, I've heard the Commodore on the Marine Corps, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Milley said it before, others have too, that boy, it'd be great if, if the end state was a little more known before we send our guys in, uh, in places like Libya, which is bubbling in the news again right now. Um, or, you know, Mosul's fine because the government of Iraq is there, but we all know Raqqa's next, and there is no government of Syria there to deal with yet, so what comes next? Um, the, you know, the services are asking for something more from the government, and we'll, we'll see if this time around they get a response. So thank you to the panel, and thank you to New America for, uh, for joining us today, and have a good day, everybody.